The text this morning is from 1 Peter chapter 2. These are the words of God. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. If so, be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom, not, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which, which, he, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors, or unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it, if when ye be buffeted for your faults, you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Father and God, we are assembled this morning in a manner we believe to be required by your word, and so we pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding with regard to that. We want to be Christians indeed, and not just Christians with a place in the liturgy. Give us eyes to see, we pray, and we ask for this in the strong name of Jesus, and amen. So last week I began uh, preaching through the epistle of 1 Peter, and as you notice, I'm going through 1 Peter uh, a chapter at a time, and uh, 1 Peter is very densely packed with truth. There's, uh, There's a lot of truth per square inch in 1 Peter. All of God's word is God's truth, but sometimes God packs it in very closely. Sometimes it's hand-packed. So preaching through 1 Peter, a chapter at a time, let me tell you what it's like. It's like inviting three people over for dinner, and for some reason you cooked a barren of beef the size of a tree stump. And you have a barren of beef the size of a tree stump, and you've got a handful of people there. That's what preaching through 1 Peter, a chapter at a time, is like. So, the exhortation, as right at the start, is open wide. <laughs> There's a lot here. Remember the broader context of this, epi- uh, this epistle, which is the need to cultivate holiness under pressure. This is written just a short time before the first uh, great Roman persecution broke out against the church, and, uh, and Peter is preparing the Christians for this time of persecution, this time of fiery trial. And what he tells them to do is he he exhorts them, he's encouraging them to cultivate a holy lifestyle, a holy lifestyle. Now, being holy is difficult. And when times are difficult, you would think, well, it's just that much more difficult. Yes, it is that much more difficult, but it is also that much more necessary. 
And as, as we begin to see as we work through this book, that pressure is not insignificant. The pressure that's going to be brought to bear is not, is not a collection of trifles. And whether or not the, the recipients of this letter are going to be able to do this is going to, be, is going to depend entirely on their relationship to the Christ stone, to Christ as the rock. Christ is the rock that accompanied Israel in the wilderness, the rock from which water came, the rock that sustained them. Christ is the rock whose works are perfect, Deuteronomy 32. Christ is the cornerstone. Christ is the stone of stumbling, as we're going to see. And there are all sorts of different relationships that we can have to Christ as the rock, Christ as the stone. But all of them come down to two. There will be either you on Christ, built on Christ, Christ is the cornerstone, you on Christ, or Christ on you, crushing you to powder. It's either Christ on you as the stone, or you on Christ as a living stone. Now, given the fact of our new birth, which uh, came up in the first chapter, given the fact of regeneration, the fact that we've been born again unto God, it is necessary to live out the ramifications of that new birth. So, Peter says, set aside every form of malice, deceit, two-facedness, envy, and bad talk. You don't set those things aside in order to become Christians. You set those things aside because you are Christians. So you've been born again to God. Therefore, put these things away. Put put them all away. Malice, deceit, every form of lying, every form of hypocrisy, every form of two-facedness, every form of envy, carping, criticizing, bad talk, all verse 1. Desire the word, he says, and do it the same way newborns desire milk. Verse 2. Desire, this, de, desire the milk of the word the way newborns desire milk. Now, uh, visitors have noted, and, and so many of you, all of you should have noted, that we have a church full of children. And the children, when they arrive here, arrive here very small. And not one of them had to take how to drink milk lessons. All of them were born hungry. That's what it is to be born, is to be born hungry. When in, in Acts, when it says that the, uh, the early disciples devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. In other words, uh, a newborn infant is born rooting for milk, looking for milk. How does, it, how does a little baby know that there's something out there called milk? Well, Peter says that you're to desire the milk of the word like that. But there's more than that. This is so that you might grow and you're di- you, you are driven in your pursuit of milk By instinct and experience both. Verse 3. A newborn knows how to root for milk that he's never tasted. But a one-year-old is also motivated by past experience. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. So uh, Peter is saying that we should pursue it two ways. One, by instinct, just the principle of new life that is within us makes us want spiritual food. If you don't want spiritual food, if your body doesn't want nourishment, if your body doesn't want food, then your body is a carcass. Your body is a dead body. Living bodies want food. And then living bodies that have tasted food and and know the delights of food have tasted that the Lord is now good, and they seek it out for that reason as well. You come to the dinner table because you're hungry and because the food that was prepared tastes good. Oh, that's my favorite dish. So, Psalm 34, 8 says, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So trusting in God, coming to God, means that you're tasting him, and you're tasting him, and you see and you know that he is good. So you've come to a living stone, Peter goes on to say in verse 4. This living stone has been accepted by God and rejected by men. This is an, import- this is an important division. This living stone that you Christians have come to is a stone that you have accepted and other men have rejected, and you have accepted this stone because God has accepted this stone. So Christ is a stone accepted by God, rejected by men, and you are not like those other men because you've come to this living stone. Those who come to the living stone are living stones themselves, fashioned into a temple where their sacrifices will be as acceptable to God as Jesus himself is. Your sacrifices, your prayers, your worship 
is as acceptable to God as Jesus Christ himself is acceptable to God. That's what it means when you say, in Jesus' name, amen. You are saying, everything I've asked for, everything I've prayed for, everything I've done here as I've been praying to you, I've wrapped up in the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ. And when I ask you to look at my prayer, I'm asking you to actually look at him. Look at Jesus and accept my prayer. Consider the obedience of Jesus and, and reward his obedience by answering my prayer. That's what it means to pray in Jesus' name. You do not pray in your own name. Too many Christians are actually praying in their own name, and they just use the little formula that they attach, in Jesus' name, amen. And in Jesus' name, amen means to them, you can open your eyes now, we're done with the prayer. That's, this, that's the liturgical signal that, that we send that we're all done. But what we're actually doing when we pray in Jesus' name is we're asking God to accept our persons, our work, our requests, our desires, our troubles, our laments, our complaints. All of them are wrapped up in Jesus, and we present them to God that way. And God is, has promised to accept everything we present to him that way, and that's what we have in verse 5. Everything that we want to have God accept from us, we want him to accept it because Jesus is acceptable. Jesus is, uh, the fact that God has accepted Jesus Christ is the basis for his acceptance of us. So scripture predicted this. God is going to lay his chief cornerstone in Zion, and the one who believes in him will not be confounded. Verse 6, if you come to Christ, you're not going to be put to confusion. If you come to Christ, you will not be confounded. Now, it's going to oftentimes look as though uh, someone standing off to the side is going to say, oh, he's in trouble now. Oh, that's going to, ha it's going to go badly. It's, it, it looks, we are tempted to think that we're going to be confounded, which is why we have this assurance in the word that we won't be. If you come to Jesus, if you come to Jesus the way the word invites you to come to Jesus, you will not be put to shame. So believers consider him precious, and those who treated him as the rejected stone will see him as established, despite their rejection, as the principal cornerstone. Verse 7, so all the, the best theologians, the best theologians in the first century, at least as far as paper credentials went, assembled together, and they tried the Messiah of God in a kangaroo court, and they, and they wanted him killed. So that's what happened. All the, all the established religious authorities, all the people who graduated from the right seminaries, all the people who had it all together, gathered together illegally, and they condemned Jesus. They rejected him. And God said, I'm going to make my principal cornerstone the rejected stone. It was important that the stone that God established as the basis of his new temple be a stone that all the assembled wise men rejected. So Jesus was sent to this earth. The wise men looked at him and said, no, not no. And they rejected him, and God said, that is my accepted cornerstone. So to them, to those who rejected him, he is the stone of stumbling, a stumbling that was assigned to them beforehand. Verse 8, in short, they rejected him because he, God, had rejected them first. This is the mystery of reprobation, which is taught as plainly in Scripture as election is. But never forget that the judge of the whole earth will do right, as it says in Genesis 18.25. In contrast, in contrast to those who, are reject, who, are, who rejected Jesus and who are manifested as thereby rejected, in contrast, you believers are his elect nation, formerly in the darkness, but now in the light. Verse 9, once you were not a people, but now you are a people under the mercy. You used to be aliens. You used to be far away from God. You used to be outside the commonwealth of Israel. But now you've been brought near. You used to be not a people. Now you are a people under the mercy. Verse 10. That being the case, since that already is the case, since God has given you that as a gift, therefore abstain from lust, he says, which is at war with your soul. Verse 11. Mark that it is your lust that is at war with your soul. Other people's lust is not at war with your soul. Your lust is at war with your soul. Live honestly among the pagans, such that they will be ashamed when they lie about you. 
verse 12. They're going to lie about you, but you want them to be shamefaced when they do it. They want, you want the lie to be so ridiculous that they're almost embarrassed to tell it. They want to, they want to say that you're the cause of all the trouble. They want to say that you're uh, the one who rejects authority. They want to say that you're the one making all the difficulties, but you want them to be embarrassed when they lie. Don't be scoff laws. Respect civil authority. We see that in verses 13 and 14. You will be slandered as anarchists. So make it plain through your orderly lives that this is a lie. Verse 15. You are slaves of Christ, making you free with regard to them. So don't abuse your liberty. Verse 16. Christ has set you free, but don't use your liberty, as Paul says in Galatians, as an excuse for sinning. Honor all men, Peter says. Love your brothers. Honor the king, verse 17. House slaves, the word for this is orketes, domestic servants, house slaves, are, are to be subject to their masters, including the harsh ones. That's in verse 18. It's praiseworthy if a man suffers when innocent, verse 19. But where's the glory if you patiently endure what you richly deserved anyway? All right, that's verse 20. Peter says, if you are flogged, but you actually deserved a flogging. There goes a man in need of a flogging, everybody said. That, that guy really needs it. If you get flogged for that reason and you endure it patiently, that, that's simply justice. You're just recognizing what is just. But when you are abused, when you're attacked, when you're criticized, because you follow Christ, because you're walking with him, if you're attacked for that reason, then that's the grace of God. That's a manifestation of the sovereign grace of God. So all of us as Christians are called to imitate his example, the Lord's example, verse 21. He did no wrong. Jesus never lied, verse 22. When he was reviled, he did not return fire, verse 23. When he suffered, he committed his case to God, also verse 23. He bore our sins in his body on the tree in order that we might be made dead to sin and live to righteousness. Verse 24. By his stripes we are healed. By his stripes, we are healed. As wounds appeared on him, so the wounds disappeared from you. As, as Christ was beaten for your sins, you were restored. We were like sheep wandering, but we've now returned to the shepherd and the bishop of our souls, verse 25. So that's a summary. That's an overview of the whole chapter. There are a few things that I want to pull out from that chapter and look at in a little more detail. The theme we considered earlier, the fact that we are strangers and pilgrims here in this world, is brought up again. So in a, a couple times in the first chapter of 1 Peter, Peter says that we are strangers, we're, we are aliens, we are here on pilgrimage. The theme considered earlier is brought up again in verse 11. You are in a strange land, Peter urges. You are in a strange land. Don't drink the water. When you, go, when you go there, there are certain things you must not do. If you go there, don't drink the water. But then, a peculiar aspect of this pilgrimage, a peculiar aspect of this exile comes out in the, in the way Peter talks about it. You are strangers in a strange land, he says, and yet this alien place that you now find yourself in does have an anchor point in you. This strange land that you're living in is the land you were born in. This strange land that you are living in now is the only land you have ever known in terms of your senses, and it has an anchor point in you. You are a stranger here now because you've heard the gospel. You're a stranger here now. You're an alien here now because you've heard the gospel, and you have believed the gospel, and you are now ordering your life according to a completely different set of principles than you were doing before. So you're a stranger in a strange land, but this strange land, has some, there's some familiarity that you have with it. You used to be a native of this place, but you were turned into a pilgrim. You are an alien now, but this is the result of the supernatural miracle called regeneration. You were, a, you were um, of your father, the devil. You belonged here. You fit right in. Paul says elsewhere that we are by nature objects of wrath. There's nothing in our nature, there's nothing in our fall, created and fallen nature that distinguishes us from the non-believers out there. You used to be 
a, a native of this dark, sin-darkened world. God, by the miracle of regeneration, has quickened you, has given you new, the new birth, and because of that new birth, you are now an alien. But the new birth does, is not the same thing as the resurrection of the dead at the end of history. At the, at the end of history, there will, be, uh, there will be nothing in us that pertains to this world's current order. Nothing in us. That's not the case now. You have a new father. Because of regeneration, you have a new father, but you are still dwelling in the country of your old father. You have a new father, but you are dwelling in the country of your old father. Not only so, but you were not turned into a pilgrim instantaneously all at once. There are aspects of you that are just like they were before. So Paul says that the inner man is being renewed day by day. Once you're born again, the spirit, the new heart, the inner man is being renewed day by day. He says the outer man, your body, is decaying. Why? Because of sin, he says. There are things that still attach to us that are there because we are we are still participants in the old order, and it's our duty as Christians to militantly and methodically war against those elements. And this is why he says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against your soul. You're, you're to be a pilgrim, but there are parts of you that don't want to be a pilgrim. You are an alien in this world, and there are parts of you that don't want to be an alien. You are someone who's completely out of place, but there are parts of you that don't want to be out of place. You want to be able to do just naturally, like a fish in water. Those people just, they just go into sin. Like, you know, they just, and they don't appear to feel bad about it. And there's a part, there's a tug. That, and that tug is the thing that you must abstain from, Peter says. This alien land still has a foothold in you, and you experience that foothold as lust or desire. Peter teaches us that the great spiritual war that is going on all around you has a counterpart within you. There is a great cultural war, there's a great spiritual war that is, that's going on between the kingdom of God, the people of the kingdom, between the church and the unbelievers. There's a great macro war that's going on out there. Inside you, there's a micro war counterpart. Inside you, that same large conflict is written, is engraved on the head of a pin, and, and, and you feel that tension. You feel that turning. Peter says, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. When you don't, when you don't abstain, when you give way, it is like you're trafficking with the enemy. It's like you're selling secrets to the enemy. It's like you're, go, you're going over to the other side. So there's a counterpart within you. There's a there's a part of you that wants to chuck it all and go back to the old ways. Don't listen. Don't go there. Don't try to argue with lust. Never try to argue with lust. Because lust has one argument. And that is, I want. Right? You tell, tell a two-year-old. You can see the two-year-old, the, the embodiment of lust in a two-year-old. Don't do that. But, he says, reasoning closely, follow me here. I want to. Right? No, but I don't want you. I'm, I'm your mom. I'm your dad. No. But, but he says, coming back, maybe you didn't understand my point. My point is that I want to do this thing. Is there any reasoning with that? No. There's no argument. Right? That argument is, I want this, and the only thing that will make me happy is if I get this. That's, that uh, lust is Johnny One Note. Lust has one argument, one speed, one setting, and, you, and, and Peter just says, turn it off. Walk away. Say no. Right? You, you, you can't reason with it. If you're reasoning with your lusts, you have already lost. If you're reasoning with your lusts, you have already lost. Just like when, you've, when you're reasoning with the two-year-old who says, but I want, but I want, but I want. If you're down on your knees explaining to them how they really don't want that, this thing, <laughs> as you've seen many moms in Walmart do, right? You have, you have this problem, you're, you're explaining to them, you're, you, the parent, are the voice of sweet reason. But they are deaf to sweet reason, because they want. Right? You're, just imagine your lusts as a very ugly two-year-old, right? and, and deal with them accordingly. Spank them, put them to bed. 
So Peter says, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul. There's something else in this that, is, that really rubs us, it, it rubs our fur the wrong way in our individualistic era. And that is the section in 1 Peter 2 where Peter talks about honor and submission. So I want you to look ahead. Look, look ahead to uh, chapter 3, the first, the first word in chapter 3. Likewise, ye wives, likewise. That word is important. And then jump down to verse 7. Likewise, ye husbands. Now we're going to consider this next week what wives ought to be doing, what husbands ought to be doing. But I want you to note that Peter links what he's telling the wives and what he's telling the husbands. He links it back to what he's telling us here in chapter 2. Likewise, ye wives. So whatever he's talking about, he's he's continuing his theme. Likewise, ye wives, behave in this way. And then likewise, ye husbands, behave in this way. So they are to be in subjection to their husbands likewise. Likewise to what? And the answer is found in this chapter. The answer is found in chapter 2. All believers are told to be subject to every ordinance of man. Verse 13. Look back at verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. So all believers everywhere are told to submit to every ordinance of man. Not some, not some ordinances, but to just the generic command is submit to every ordinance of man. Now, I, I, I do want to say one thing. There are times when the ordinances of man come down to a point where they say, don't preach the gospel, and we're, we're told um, that we must preach the gospel, and, and we're given our answer in Acts look, you judge for yourselves whether we should obey God or man. There are times where you have to decide whether you're going to obey God or obey man. Remember that Jesus, the one that we're told to imitate at the end of this chapter, was executed by the authorities, right? And and he wasn't executed by the authorities because he was so cooperative in doing what they wanted, right? That's that's not, and that's that's one of the big problems with saccharine liberalism where, where Jesus is portrayed as the original flower chi- child. Right? Uh, Jesus was portrayed as walking around telling people to be nice to each other. Share, he said. Share, be nice, be sweet. And of course, they executed him. No, they, people are not executed for telling people to be swell neighbors. That's not what happens. Jesus ran afoul of the authorities, and he didn't run afoul of the authorities because he was cooperating with them. But he cooperated, he submitted himself in the way that this is talking about. So, we're told to submit to the authorities. Every human authority is true authority, but no human authority is absolute. So, and then in verse 18, you have the same thing, uh, similar thing. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear not only to the good and gentle, but also to the froward. Froward means harsh. All right, so domestic slaves are told to be subject to their masters, including the harsh ones, verse 18. And then in verses 21 through 23, Christ himself suffered great indignities at the hands of revilers. So then in chapter 3, verse 1, wives are told to follow these examples, but wait, we're not done. Look down at verse 7. Husbands, likewise, husbands are told to follow the same example. Wives are to likewise submit themselves. Husbands are to likewise submit themselves with all adjustments made according to office and station. So any Christian anywhere who has people who ought to be subject to him, an employer, a political authority, a husband, a father, Any Christian anywhere who has people who ought to be subject to him, father, employer, husband, so forth, therefore has a glorious opportunity to model for everyone how easy it is to subject themselves. You want want never to be that clown who has strict views of submission with regard to those under your authority while ready to mount the barricades in rebellion of rebellious defiance if anyone above you dares to suggest that you do something you don't want to do. There are people who want to be defiant. They want to be the original Minuteman. They want to be the original defiant 
rebel. They, whenever tyranny comes, they've got a, a, a nose for tyranny. If tyranny is coming at them from above, they can smell it a mile off. And, they, and they're, ready to, they're ready to resist, and they're ready to resist to the nth degree. But then they have, uh, what's their attitude toward all the people who are under their authority? It's, here's the verse, what's your problem? Wives, submit to your husbands. What can't you read? <laughs> About as well as you can, she thinks. So, what do you do? What do you do? Um, those husbands, in, in my experience, those husbands, those husbands who abuse their patriarchal office downstream, the Bible says you must do what I say, woman, you know, that, that kind of thing. The, those husbands who abuse their patriarchal office downstream, those who would say things like the, Ephesians 5 is right here, you need to obey it, and you've got to you've got, need an attitude adjustment um, because you're not obeying it. Those husbands are the most likely to be radical libertarians when it comes to the point of their obedience. All of us are under authority. All of us are under authority. In chapter 2 and chapter 3, absolutely everyone has some sort of deference and submission that they need to show. All right, They're most, these people are most likely to be radical libertarians when it comes to them having to do something that pinches. This is no more surprising. This ought not to surprise us because we are a fallen and sinful race. This is no more surprising than to find someone carving up a pie in such a way as to get the biggest piece for himself. That it is human nature to game the system so that it comes out in your favor. That's human nature. But the new human nature in Christ is not to operate according to that kind of calculus. Nobody, nobody needs lessons when it comes to being a selfish pig. But that's not the way of Christ. We do need to be regenerated in the first place, and then we need to be instructed, like everybody is in the first verse, wherefore laying aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisies, envies, and all evil speakings. You are given, in the, in, you are given two things. You are given a new heart that is capable of listening, and then you are told something you need to listen to. You can't just say, well, I'm born again, I'm solidly converted, I'm solidly... Uh, regenerated, therefore it's all downhill from here. No, you need to be converted. That's the first step. But then the converted heart is the one that knows how to listen when God tells you, stop lying. Stop carving it up so that it always comes out to your advantage. Stop explaining everything so that you come out holding the big end of the stick. You're doing it wrong. Now, we are to submit, if you, if you look at um, chapter 2, we are, submit, we are to submit to the civil authorities. Verse 13, the verb there is hupotasso. Hupotasso. We are to submit to the civil authorities. Slaves are to submit to their masters, even the ungodly ones. And the verb used there is hupotasso. But the Lord Jesus does not call us to anything that he has not modeled for us. He has submitted for example, to his parents. In Luke 2, 51, you remember the incident when Jesus was a, a young boy. They went to Jerusalem, and he stayed behind discussing things with the rabbis, and they didn't miss him for a day or two, and then they came back and they found him. It says in Luke 2, 51, that Jesus went with them, and it says he submitted himself to them. Hupotasso. Jesus did what he's telling us to do. Jesus did what he's telling us to do. And if anyone had an excuse not to, if anyone, if anyone ever had the right to say, Mom, you don't understand, it would have been the perfect human being, right? But Jesus said, submitted himself. And he models, for, he models for us what he wants us to do. He wants us to submit to civil authorities. He wants us to not be scofflaws. He wants children submitting to their parents. He wants wives submitting to their husbands. He wants husbands modeling for the household what it is to be a dutiful Christian who is acknowledging rightful and godly authority above him, and so on. All of us need this. It's, it is not the case. It is not the case that one quadrant of Christians have to submit to people and the other group of Christians does not have to submit to people. That's not the way it works. I remember many years ago talking to a man who's, he was a member of a church 
that, and the elders had gone in big for authority and submission. Demand, the elders can tell you whatever to, to do whatever they want you to do, and you've got to do it because the elders say, you must obey me here, you must obey me there, you must, you must submit to me because the Bible says, and the Bible does say in Hebrews, submit to those who have the rule over you. Uh, uh, elders do have spiritual authority, but these elders were on a power trip, and they were saying, do this, obey, submit to me. And this man said to them, I'm an ignorant Christian. Show me how. How do I do that? Model it for me. I want, you to, I want to see you model it for me. We need, to, we, need, we need to defer to one another. All of us are under authority in some way, shape, or form, and we need to model what this demeanor of the Christian is like, and Jesus himself did it. Jesus himself did it, and we have to follow, his, follow in his steps. Now, one of the great themes of this chapter is the fact that Jesus is the stone. Jesus is the stone. We are considering Christ as the stone. Christ is the Christ stone. Christ is everlastingly the same, yesterday, today, and forever. But the reactions to him vary, and they vary wildly and widely. Christ is either the living stone, the cornerstone, upon which all other living stones are fitted and placed, or he is rejected as having that role, and he becomes to them, the people who reject him, he becomes to them the stone of stumbling. He's the same. He's the same stone. He's the cornerstone, or he's the stone of stumbling. But he doesn't change. He doesn't change the, the attitude of the people coming to him, looking at him, considering him. Their, uh, their responses are different, but he is not any different. So, these different reactions do not prevent him, this, the attitude of rejecting him, does not prevent him from becoming the cornerstone, but they do prevent themselves from being built up into the holy temple. And so in Isaiah 28, 16, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, he that believeth shall not make haste. This is the passage from Isaiah that is quoted here in 1 Peter 2. It's also quoted in Romans 10, verse 11. So God lays in Zion, he comes to Zion, and he lays a foundation stone. He lays a cornerstone. The workmen who've been working on the building for some time revolt against him, and they try to pry up the cornerstone. They say, no, we don't want that we don't want that cornerstone. We don't want the building to go that way. They, they set themselves against the cornerstone. And then Isaiah predicts this also. Isaiah 8, 14. And he shall be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This stone was a trap. This stone was the foundation of everything God was going to do down through all subsequent church history. This stone was the cornerstone of all God's plans. This was everything. This was it. And this stone was also simultaneously a trap for those builders who thought they knew better than the architect. Those builders who thought that they could make adjustments on the fly. Those builders who thought that they had authority because they were trained theologians. They knew how to re read blueprints. And they said, we, because we know how to read blueprints and we've memorized the blueprints, we have the authority to change the blueprints. And so God sent his cornerstone and the builders said no. The builders revolted against the architect. This passage from Isaiah 8 it's quoted in 1 Peter 2, and it's also quoted in Romans 9, 33. In Romans, Paul tells us the nature of the stumbling. What was it that caused the builders to, re to rebel against the architect? The issue was, as it always is, the question of works righteousness as opposed to grace righteousness. Righteousness that is the gift of God or righteousness that we get by our own energetic efforts. Works righteousness, which is of the devil, and grace righteousness, which is from the hands of God. Stumbling over a cornerstone of sheer grace 
is to go about to establish a righteousness of your own. Whatever other stone you want to put there instead of Christ, whatever other stone you want to put there is going to depend in some way on your intelligence, your good looks, your moral efforts, your comparative advantage over other people. It's going to depend somehow on you. But what God says is, I want your salvation to depend upon Christ and Christ alone. Christ is the only way that we can be saved. It's all of Christ and only Christ. So stumbling over the cornerstone of sheer grace is is to go about to establish your own righteousness. And this is something that the human heart perennially wants to do. In Psalm 118, it says this, The stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. So notice, the builders rejected the architect and the builders rejected the architect come himself as the stone. The architect says, I'm, I've uh, sent my son, I've, I've given myself to be worked into this building, and the builder said, nothing doing. They rejected that stone. Now, God reversed their decision. They rejected the stone, so God rejected them. And what does the psalm say? It is marvelous in our eyes. This reversal is marvelous to the Christian. This is quoted in our text, 1 Peter 2. This uh, passage from Psalm 118 is also quoted in Acts 4.11, in Luke 20, verse 17, in Mark 12, in Matthew 21. This is how the Lord understood himself. The Lord Jesus understood himself as the rejected stone, rejected by men, accepted by God, and therefore accepted by every believing heart. So this brings us down to the essential question before every one of us here right now. There is a great reversal here. There's a great reversal here. Approved men rejected Jesus. God rejected the approved men. God overrode them and installed his cornerstone anyway. And here's the question. What do you think of that? What, do you, what is your reaction to that? There's a great reversal here, and so what do you think of it? Do you applaud the rejection of this stone, showing that you are thereby yourself rejected by God? Or do you rejoice in the fact that God has made the rejected stone of absolute grace, nothing but grace, grace all the way through, nothing but grace in this stone? Do you rejoice in the fact that God has made the rejected stone of absolute grace into the cornerstone of your only possible hope. That's the alternative. You either reject Jesus or you reject the men who rejected Jesus. Either they speak for you, the Sanhedrin either speaks for you or the Sanhedrin does not speak for you. If the Sanhedrin does not speak for you, then Jesus speaks for you. So how do you understand him? It is either marvelous in your eyes that God has brought about this great reversal, taking the rejected stone as the principal stone, or your eyes are blinded to the nature of the Christ stone, resulting in a blindness and a stumbling that was appointed to you as your appointed destiny. You either have your eyes open to what Jesus is actually offering us as as the cornerstone, or you are... are, you're going along with the rejection of him. You're either saying amen to what the Sanhedrin did or you are resisting. You, you're saying, God, I delight in the fact that you've overturned the judgment of the Sanhedrin. You took their hatred of Jesus and turned their hatred into an instrument for the salvation of the world. And that is marvelous in my eyes. And so, consider what it says in Matthew 21, the theme of the stone. Jesus says this, Jesus says this, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. So whoever falls on this stone is going to be broken. Whoever has this stone fall on him, he's going to be crushed to powder. So there are only two alternatives, broken and built or stumbled and crushed. Broken on the stone and then built up into a living stone, broken on the stone and then built into the temple, or 
the stone falls on you, you stumble over the stone, the the stone falls on you, and you are crushed. But it is Jesus either way. It is Christ either way. Everyone in this world has to deal with Christ. Christ is the inescapable man. He is before every man. He's in front of every man. It is either a cornerstone for building or a crushing stone for destruction. It's Christ either way. It is not whether you will deal with Christ, but rather how you will deal with Christ. It's not whether you respond to Christ, but how you respond to Christ. It is not whether you will have an encounter with Christ. You are having an encounter with Christ right now. Everyone has an encounter with Christ. It is not whether you have an encounter with Christ. It's what kind of encounter with him you will have. Fall on the stone, fall on the stone to be broken and raised into everlasting glory or have the stone fall on you resulting in an everlasting and miserable, very miserable powder. Either fall on the stone, everlasting glory, or the stone falls on you and an everlasting and miserable powder. Our good Father, we thank you for the forms of worship that you've given to us. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would make us ever mindful of the need that we have to keep a holy relationship with you central to all of it. Prevent us from falling into the folly of thinking that we could ever just decorate the outside of something and somehow fool you. Walk with us, we pray, and hear us now as we offer back to you the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, The Apostle Paul does not draw the kind of antithesis that we might expect between the table of the Lord and the food that we eat throughout our daily lives. In this passage from Corinthians that we've been considering, he talks about the Lord's Supper as a sacrament, the manna and water of the wilderness, meat eaten by the Levites from the Old Testament sacrifices, dinner parties thrown by pagans, meat previously offered to idols, and meat consumed in the context of idolatrous worship. We have food of all kinds discussed, and all of it relates somehow to the table of the Lord. Of course, the point is not that all food is strictly speaking to be thought of as the Lord's Supper, but the point is that all food is under the authority of the Lord's Supper. There's no such thing as autonomous food, Everything we eat must be related by faith back to our right to sit down here at this table. We are disciplined by this. We are taught by it. We are fed by it. Put another way, we receive strength here, strength and wisdom to eat properly elsewhere. If we do not understand what we are doing here, then how can we possibly understand the bewildering array of food that confronts us everywhere we look? If we do not understand these two simple elements, bread and wine, then how can we possibly be obedient Christians when it comes to sorting out all the questions and all the menu choices that face us three times a day? All of us spend a great deal of time putting food in our mouths. This is what God wants. He created us this way. But he wants us to do so by faith. And that means partaking rightly here by faith, asking to be made wise. So fence the tables by fencing the table here. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. The charge is this. John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace, an 18th century uh, pastor, once described a particular kind of lousy sermon uh, this way. He said, it's like a letter addressed to no one in particular, no address on the envelope. And if you, if you opened up the envelope, if a hundred people opened up the envelope and read the letter, not one of them would, would think themselves in any way concerned with the contents. It has nothing to do with them, in other words. But biblical sermons always preach to a decision. The whole point of of the proclamation of the gospel is to present you with a decision. And if the Spirit is working in you as as he promises to, and as I trust he is, when you hear the message of, of Christ proclaimed, you should always walk away thinking, what shall I do? What shall I do? The decision is before you. You're either built on the rock or you're trying to resist it. What shall I do? It always comes down to that razor, uh, razor thin edge. What shall I do? You shall receive the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.